And I'm really excited to speak to you because I have actually paid my own money to buy tickets to go and see your show before realising oh. that I was going to be talking to you about it. Oh, um, well, thank you. Have, have you been to any of my other uh, I haven't, shows? no, but I've listened to your uh, podcast, which is excellent, uh, uh, Things Fell Apart, and excited to see how that's going to work out as a live show. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, for, for the people listening who maybe haven't discovered your podcast yet, um, it's about the origins of the online culture wars, Things like yeah. whether trans women are women, uh, critical race theory, abortion, QAnon. This is not easy territory, John. Why go there? Well, you know what? I mean, that makes it sound like a much darker and less enjoyable listen than it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what it actually is, and I should say, this isn't the first time. Like many times over, over the years, I've had to explain to people, like, you know, this this book or this show may sound like something you may not want to hear, but actually it's really great. And I think that's the case with this one. That it's, it, what, it, what it really is, is these incredible twisty, turny human stories that, they, and, and, um, that I found. I wanted to like ignore the noise and ignore all the, all the anger um, and, and make a show about the culture wars that wasn't going to inflame anyone. And, um, you know, that was my aim. And the way, the way I thought to do that was to just make it human stories, just tell human stories. And very quickly, I realized that at the, at the origin of an awful lot of these tales were just these extraordinary, unexpected, very human tales with twists and turns and revelations and cliffhangers. And when people hear stories like that, their brain moves away from, you know, being inflamed, being angry, being passionate, and, be, and instead becomes curious and, and and hopefully empathetic. And yeah. uh, so that was my aim for the show. Uh, and I think, you know, by and large, it happened. Um, you found some really surprising, really moving things. I know the thing that a lot of people talk about having listened to, to the series is, is about the televangelist, Tammy Faye mm. Baker, and how she managed to find such a connection with, with an HIV positive gay Christian who was on her show. Tell us yeah. about that. Well, actually, if we had full-blown AIDS, um, this was 1982. This does seem to be kind of the standout. Um, I mean, I think all the episodes are great, but this is one that people are talking about the most. Um, it's about, in the early 1980s, televangelism swept America, and most of the televangelists were, you know, kind of horrible people. They were very right-wing. Um, Jerry Falwell, politicist, uh, you know, he, he really, politicized millions of people by creating this group, the moral majority. Uh, and amongst other things, he was virulently homophobic. And when AIDS came along, he convinced Ronald Reagan, who arguably owed his election victory to Jerry Falwell, uh, not to say the word AIDS in public. And Reagan didn't for four years. Hence all the silence, if people are old enough to remember, all the silence equals death stuff that was going around at the time. There was a there was a conspiracy of silence around AIDS for years. So in the midst of this, Tammy Faye Baker, who was a televangelist, um, she was feeling more and more isolated from her evangelical peer group because they were just so unpleasant, and many of them were fraudulent too. Uh, so she invited. She had a little afternoon chat show called Tammy's House Party, and she invited a gay pastor with full blown AIDS, Steve Peters, to be on the show, and it was just the most extraordinary moving sad funny awkward but ultimately just really inspiring conversation between the two of them that did such an incredible amount of good over the years like rippled through both communities I'd mm -hmm. say the evangelist community and the uh, and, and the gay community and just did an awful lot to heal the rift so if we're looking to end culture wars then I think there's some lessons there so that was the first miracle but when people listen to the show they'll discover that there's other miracles in that story too. So you're you're looking for nuance and common understanding. Isn't that totally contrary to the spirit of our times at the moment? Well, the fact that the Tammy Faye show, the, the, the Steve Peters Tammy Faye episode of Things Fell Apart, I had so many messages from people saying, you know, they were 
sobbing while driving up the M6 and they had to pull into a lay-by because they were like, it, was, it wasn't safe for them to drive because they were crying. So that makes me suspect, and there's been research to back it up, that most people want an end to this, this war that, that we're all living in. We're, we're, we're battle weary. This is a war, when I say, you know, the, the culture wars, um, that a maximum of 30% of the population want Mm. Uh, most and, and I didn't just pull that figure out from nowhere like there's been research on this 14% of the American population are sort of hardcore warriors from either the left or the right then an extra 20% are sort of hardcore enough to perpetuate you know want to perpetuate these battles and the other 70% just don't want anything to do with it they're just yeah. sick of it they're battle worried they're exhausted uh, and I think those think, were the people who were, who were emailing me after that show came out. Do you think people are scared of the culture wars? Do you think, because there are, there are conversations that I want to have, that I've wanted to have on this show, that I, I'm brave, I'm a brave person to have them, but it's almost like you, you're, the internet is forcing us to pick a side and you can't mm. say, okay, well, I agree with that that you're saying, but then on the other hand, I, I also agree what, with what so-and-so is saying. We're being divided in such a way that unless you're on, on a particular team, you're encouraged to keep quiet. Well, I'd argue that, I mean, yes, everything you just said is, is clearly true. However, you know, and I don't want to make this all about like me and my storytelling style, but I would say that, you know, I, for want of a better phrase, both sided quite a lot of the uh, stories and things fell apart to, to, to know, to, you know, know very little criticism. I, you know, the problem with both sidesing, the problem with the phrase both sizing is that what it implies is false equivalencies, mm. it implies people manipulating other people by almost gaslighting them. But, you know, there's another version of both sizing things, which is just letting people talk with curiosity and not forcing people into a defensive position. And, um, I, and, and I, I'd say that, you know, things fell apart, demonstrates that you can that actually you can do it as long as you you know do it quite meticulously or as meticulously as you possibly can. Um, people people really do want it. As the, you know the, the, the phrase false equivalency. I mean the worst thing that happened. The worst thing that happened to the phrase both sides was when Trump said there were very fine people on both sides of Charlottesville. Like that <laughs> set that set the both sides cause back years because of the kind of extraordinary false equivalency that he was that he was you know employing there i think part of the reason why people are afraid of, of talking about these kind of contentious subjects these culture war subjects is because of the fear of saying the wrong thing and getting cancelled and mm. you wrote about public shaming in 2015 i mean do you think that's the same thing as being cancelled first of all well sort of um I, I think the worst thing that came along, the worst thing that happened to that debate was the phrase cancel culture. I, and and the, I mean, it's a good phrase. I, I mean, I sort of wish I'd thought of the phrase and I could have put it, could have put it in the book. But it's become a very messy phrase uh, because it incorporates all these, you know, wildly different sets of circumstances from, you know, this is Times Radio, you know, from Times columnists who would write, who write something agent provocatory and then get an awful lot of pushback and criticism. Um, you know, that's one set of circumstances and they'll say, I'm being canceled. Are they being canceled? Um, a, a British culture has, has for, for decades, has, you know, yelled at agent provocateur columnists, but maybe it's happening a, a little bit more intensely now as a result of social media. So something new is happening, but it's an old phenomenon. Mm. Then you've got people being disproportionately punished for like, some minor transgression, a joke that comes out badly, a private individual with a hundred Twitter followers suddenly finds himself the most famous person on Twitter that day. Uh, and that's a completely different set of circumstances. And then you've got like, you know, politicians who commit sexual assault who say they're being canceled. So it's impossible to, to um, have one phrase for those three sets of circumstances. Do you think the big tech companies are getting rich off these culture wars? Yes, uh, the internet was created by libertarian tech utopians uh, who just want unencumbered free speech. I think probably firstly for ideological reasons, but then secondly for business reasons. They realised that this, you know, their libertarian ideology was just making everybody mad. 
and in and in that you know madness they were all making more money because people were like clicking more because they were so angry mm -hmm. so yeah that's the world you know we allowed um the libertarian tech utopians to create the world that we've been living in for the past well since 1987 88. over the past 10 years or so you've written so much about digital tech, you've written about uh, free porn and how that's affected uh, porn performers, the porn industry, you've written about uh, public shaming and about uh, the culture wars. But over the same time, you seem to have withdrawn from it because I've been following you on Twitter for a long time. You used to be such a prolific tweeter and now you're barely there. Um, what is it you've learned about the digital world that's made you want to stay away? It's a good question, and thank you for noticing. I wasn't one of those people who left Twitter with a big announcement. I thought that you know, I just get faintly irritated when people do. No, you know, I mean, fine. Um, but yeah, I did just gently drift away. And why? I think one reason was because I realised, you know, that each of us have our own best modes of discourse. We 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 have our best way of. Years ago, somebody said to me, like when Twitter was really young. Someone said to me, yeah, Lena Dunham on Twitter, like, what is she doing? She has her own show on HBO, like Girls, <laughs> which, where she gets to express herself in the most perfect way. And then she like blars out all of this bollocks on Twitter. And, I th and honestly, I thought that was a good point. There's other people on Twitter who are really good at it. I mean, Molly John Fuss, for instance, is a, is a great tweeter. Like, there's great tweeters out there who are just very good at the form. And you know, I, I realise that I'm better at talking in different ways than, than on Twitter is, is, is one of the main reasons. I thought my best way of communicating to people is sitting alone for months, you know, thinking about exactly the, the right way of telling a story. And then the story comes out and, you know, 99 times out of 100, I'm really proud of the result. Whereas, you know, some tossed off old tweet, uh, isn't the same thing. At the beginning of Twitter, I thought this is a great, this is a place where, where, where writers can be unselfconscious. We can tweet about what we had for breakfast. Like, this is good. This is like a positive thing. It's like unstressful writing. But very quickly that became like unfashionable on Twitter. What you had for breakfast was, was what people didn't want to hear about. They wanted it to be more performative. So that's one of the reasons why I left. I just realized it wasn't the best mode, mode of discourse for me. But then for other reasons, you know, once you've been ripped to shreds a couple of times you you feel like you know eve after eating the apple you know you're no longer unself-conscious so that's the second reason and then i and then and, and but i got to i got to a i got to a stage where i was like physically repulsed by the thought of twitter like um i'm, I'm not told anybody this but and it's just a very small thing but when dawn foster died last year like i really wanted like she was such a great shining light and, um, I, you know, but I, I didn't tweet anything because I just felt repelled by just the thought of, of tweeting anything. Um, and the only reason I've returned briefly now is because, uh, uh, it's because I've got a show out and I want people to know about it. <laughs> so that's well, the true answer. I mean, what, what, what do you think? I mean, if you know, I mean, what, what's your views on, on, you know, how Twitter's evolved and how you feel about being on Twitter? I feel really afraid to say anything on Twitter. And I think that it saps a lot of my mental energy and um, you get lost down, even though I never participate in these culture wars, I find myself spending hours re reading people having arguments and both sides are really odious. And I think mm. it's a really, it's a really bad use of my uh, mental energy, but I'm I'm addicted to it. <laughs> I mean, I still go on to even when I was off Twitter, I'm still on it, like like as a as a lurker. It's still great for. I still love the fact that um, people who would be so socially awkward in real life that if you met them at a party, you, you would just you couldn't talk to them are really eloquent and funny on Twitter and all of these different voices, all of these all of these kind of you know diverse voices that you wouldn't normally have access to, you suddenly mm. have access to. Plus it's really great for breaking news when when news is correct. <laughs> it's also the world's worst information swapping service as well. But but there is a lot of good and it makes you feel, you know, um, when you're isolated, it makes you feel less alone. Um, when people are sort of kind to you. So there's a lot of good about Twitter as well. But but the bad things are so bad. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to be on self. It's hard to, you know, just be on there in a kind of relaxed way. Mm. Yes, I think so too. So it's a, a love-hate thing, but mainly hate. Yeah, 
if I'm, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, you know, we had a Twitter president who nearly destroyed democracy and might still, if, you know, 2024 goes, you know, worst case scenario. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's been, it's been ultimately, on the other hand though, it's been, it's, it, in some ways, it's been a fantastic level of playing field. Um, in some ways it has, 